Okay, Teresa Headley grew up in the Comox Valley and attended school in Comox and was later a teacher in Cumberland. She married somebody from the military and as a result has had the opportunity to travel and live many places around Canada, including Barrie, north of Toronto, um, Halifax and Ottawa, and has worked as an educator, curriculum designer and an author. She's lived back in the Comox Valley since 2019, and she's happy to be here. Yeah. Teresa is a mother of three young adults, one of whom has autism. Aiming to build resilience in families living with autism, Teresa and Eric, who is her son with autism, co-wrote a 20 article series for Autism Matters magazine entitled, I Have Autism and I Need Your Help. Additionally, Teresa worked with, directly with families and school boards in Ottawa as an autism consultant and advocate. In collaboration with the Family Education Centre, she co-designed an interactive online parenting program called Pathways to Potential, Parenting Children and Youth with Autism. What's Not Allowed, A Family journal, Journey with Autism is the memoir that her presentation today is based upon. Thank you, for, thank you Teresa, for being here this evening. <laughs> oh, thank you, Natalie. You're such a wonderful presenter. I hope I can maintain your beautiful smile throughout. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to um, share our experiences this evening and uh, to the Vancouver Island Regional Libraries for making this possible as well. And I think Zoom is a great platform because we can join from all over. I see some names that, that I recognize and from across Canada as well as locally, so that's wonderful. And I know that if you're local, I especially thank you because it's our last beautiful evening and there are choices. You could have been outside, but you're here. So I thank you for that. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. And oh, I've got two versions there. We'll assume that this is the one that I want. And here we go. So what matters on the autism journey? Well, a lot of things matter, and we're going to look at some of those this evening and what the difference makers have been for us. Our autism, autism journey began with three words. What's not allowed? And that's also the, the title of the memoir. I whirl around astonished and observe Eric pointing to a nearby sign. It is a series of circles with red slashes through them. No littering, no loitering, no skateboarding. He is pointing at this sign and he's animated. He's asking what it means. In my relief to hear this little gush of language, I have no idea that these words may be telling me something more, deeper and significant. Obsession with symbols and signs is an autism marker. So this was Eric at around age two, and he hadn't spoken much. He was drawing our attention, uh, saying that's, you know, that's, that's, that. So he certainly was um, showing us what he was interested in, but he wasn't speaking. And as a mother and a teacher, I think I was labeling everything. And I'm sure every time we went to the park, I said, that's a what's not allowed sign. And then one day he repeated that back. And it was the first thing I heard him say that I understood. So. This is what mattered to our toddler based upon these books. And <laughs> to tell you, we took hundreds of pictures and this was before digital photography. We became, as a family, it was like a family project, obsessed with these, these, these signs. And when you start noticing them, you're going to see them everywhere, at the airport, at the park, at the beach, wherever you go. And it told us that rules were important to him. Order was important to him. Routine was important to Eric certainty, structure, predictability. That mattered to him. And if you just sort of pull back and think of us all right now during the pandemic, these things matter to all of us. It's not just about autism, it's about all of us. And when our environment tilts such as it has during this pandemic, we realize how important this is. So structure, routine, predictability, certainty, we began to live this way and these became our family pillars because what worked for Eric, 
it worked for the rest of us. And we knew that if we lived this way, life would be easier for him. He, we didn't know he had autism at the time, but it seemed that he was very particular in everything he did. And then I began to write about this orderly life of ours and how we often travel sidetracks and sometimes completely go off track. But that's okay. Off trail travel is where the adventure begins. And if you can see me in the side here, I use this all the time. And this is my symbol for reframe. And it's a handy thing to have as a parent. You have to reframe. Sometimes, you know, things go really off, but that's where the learning takes place. And writing about all this helped me to make sense of this life I began to, to live with my son with autism. And I call these the, you can see on here, the eureka moments, the, um, the aha. So I thought, how about I take these aha moments and also all of the wisdom that people have taught us along our journey, and why not write about it and pay it forward? And my idea at the time and, and now is, you know, if you imagine our life journeys as a, as a game board, and especially snakes, snakes and ladders is appropriate because we move ahead and we often slide back. Why start at square one when maybe you can start at square 17 because you've learned things from other people? And that was my idea behind writing this book. I think also I was writing to the former me, the me 16 years ago when this journey began. And I was trying to imagine everything that would have been handy for me to know at that time. And everything that I was feeling, I tried to sort of make sense of that. So I call these the glimmers, connection, direction, illumination, and hope. And I think no matter what journey we're on, whether it be an autism journey, whether we're supporting someone with another diagnosis or um, cancer or at the end of their life or anything, we all need these four markers. We need to know that what we're living has been lived by someone before, experienced by them. And we need to know that what we're feeling is, is normal and it's, it's predicted and predictable and it's okay. And that the emotions we're feeling, the very deep emotions are felt by others. And there's great comfort in that. So, and the direction part is offering some solutions, perhaps, illumination, some aha, and that hope, of course, is what we all hope to give one another. So these glimmers are why I began to write. And this leads us to what I discovered and what we discovered as a family during our journey and during the writing process. What matters? So, Having a, you know, the, the teacher mind and the curriculum development mind, I thought, well, I need to think about that. What do I mean by matter? What does matter mean in the context of autism? And I thought about it, and it means what shapes the way we see diversity and neurodiversity? What helps us to see this and to understand it? What affects the way we think and speak about autism? What allows us to connect with and understand our child? And what enables growth for those with autism? And this is what I was really aiming at, especially for parents. How can you help to bring out the potential in your child and make them the best version of, of the person they are? So I began to think about that. I thought, well, what matters in terms of those four um, markers? Well, belief matters. We need to believe in our children and we need to show them that we believe in them. Knowledge matters. I need to know about everything about autism. I began to read and read and read. Words matter. The words I speak to Eric and about Eric, they matter. Family, structure, relationship, visuals. He's very visual. Celebration. We need to be celebrating what he enjoys. Environment, positivity. The words kept coming. So much matters. And I kept thinking about them. So I wrote them down. Sensory matters. Self-regulation matters. Self-awareness. Eric needs to know everything about himself so that he can make changes if he wishes to. Environment. Routine. Acceptance. So much matters. And then more. And I got covered up in, in, the, <laughs> in the flurry of words. Advocacy matters. Respect matters. 
appreciation matters, um, attunement, curiosity, perspective. There are so many difference makers and these there could, you know, there are more and I could speak for two hours, three hours. But I thought what I would do is just take a handful of those and let's explore them and these themes that have made a difference for us on our journey. So there's those are Eric's lovely hands and he's holding some of the difference makers. So what I thought we would do is play a game of picture story charades where I will give you a visual of what matters. But let me just back that up. The reason I'm doing this is because if you ask somebody with autism what matters to you and how do you see the world, they will tell you that they are visual thinkers. They think in pictures. And so I like to teach that way in order to connect. And I teach parents that way so that they can use pictures with their own children. So I'm going to give you a visual. And when I give you that visual, I want you to imagine why I did, what matters. And then I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. And then together, we're going to discover what matters. Okay, let's begin the first one. All right, what do you think matters here? When we know better, we do better. Knowledge is power to see the right thing, to deny the right thing, to understand the right thing, and to do the right thing. As I read, I silently rebel, angry, incredulous, and lost, trying in one moment to brace for impact and in the next to beat back the likelihood of a diagnosis. But oddly, the words are a relief because there is kinship and comfort in shared trauma. My breathing slows and I am learning what I might need to know. What I read does fit. Eric is close. And if I can make things easier for him in the meantime, I will. Now, this is a scene that came right after I was called into Eric's school in Nova Scotia and he was in kindergarten. He was five and he was not doing very well. And his teachers sort of indicated that they thought that he might be on the autism spectrum. I knew nothing about autism. I came home and what did I do? Of course, I Googled it. And uh, that's where I was reading over the computer and learning about autism, my first exposure to it. And so my epiphanies, as I learned more and more and read books and went to conferences, was that learning about autism helps me to stand in my son's shoes and to see the world through his eyes. And that if I'm standing in my shoes and looking at his behavior, I'm not gonna get it right. I can't be right standing in the wrong shoes. I can only be right trying to be him. So there's his rather large shoes. He's 22 and their shoes are much larger than mine. And uh, he, an example was when he was little, he used to run and butt his head into my stomach and into my husband's stomach and just literally charge at us. And we thought he was being aggressive. But what we understood through reading is that he was trying to get sensory input to his head and trying to figure out where his body was in space and, and trying to feel some deep pressure on his head. So I ended up making him a, a weighted cushion, which he put on his head and he felt much better. But once I understood that it was all about sensory things, it completely changed the way I saw that behavior. So knowledge, that's the light bulb at the beginning. Knowledge absolutely matters. Everything suddenly makes sense. There is a reason for all of the behavior that you see, it's communication. And it could be sensory, it could be structural in the brain that he just can't do that. It could be chemical. And when we know better, we absolutely do better with our children. And uh, this is an example of swimming lessons, uh, lesson, I think, level one, which Eric took probably three times. And he looked like he was non-compliant at the beginning. He was all tucked to the side, not looking at the instructor. And uh, But what we discovered was that there were too many twos, I say. It was too cold, too bright, too noisy, too crowded. There were too many kids in the class and he had to wait too long. So once we made adjustments, 
and got him a, a wetsuit, got him goggles, put him in a semi-private class and, to, and, it, and had an instructor who was very visual, as you can see here, then Eric did much better. So when we know better, we absolutely, we do better as supporters. This one, what do you think? What matters here? I begin to have a series of epiphanies and these personal truths are seated in my past. My reaction to autism existed long before I was handed Eric's diagnosis. How I see my child is how my child will come to see himself. In this realization, I am reminded of my father. How do I see Eric? Original or damaged? Teachable or limited? Astute or average? disabled or differently abled. The words I choose will dictate outcomes. With words, I sculpt. With words, I was sculpted. My epiphany is here. If knowledge is power, then words are definitely the power source. When you receive a diagnosis of autism, it's pretty overwhelming for parents. There are a lot of heavy words and you can see them in this diagram here and words like disorder and limited and restricted and self injurious and compulsive. And if I, I found that I was absolutely pulled down by those words and I started to look at my son that way. And then I said to myself, okay, stop. I can choose where I set the dial and I can choose what to accentuate the attributes, the good stuff I see happening with Eric, or all of these heavy challenges. I have to acknowledge these, we're going to work on these, but I don't have to leave the dial there. Words absolutely matter. There's a great quote um, that was passed along to me by Kim Barthel. She's an occupational therapist, an international speaker, and just a wonderful person. And uh, I think she learned these words from a university professor in Winnipeg, she said, build them up before you take them apart. Start by accentuating the positive qualities and the talents and inclinations in your child. Tell them what they're good at. When we add positive layers, we begin to address the challenge bef uh, before we begin to address the challenges in our children. It, it's so for them it just completely builds them up and then we can go and start to tweak the little things that are difficult for them and make it easier for them for example i, I say to eric you're i love the way you notice things in nature and you point out shadows to me and backlighting and um the signs that were everywhere that i never saw before and his sense of direction is exceptional and um he notices little things that most of us miss and, and his, his um, chronology and he could uh, call up um, dates and, and events in his head. And I tell him about all these things and that builds him up. And then we get to the other stuff. So words absolutely make all the difference. They matter. Each word we speak has the power to shape and to empower or to erode and diminish. And I discovered that I'm a sculptor and each word I speak to Eric and about him to others counts. Okay, here's him when he was about three years old, four years old, and he loved to line things up. So we consider this picture and we think, well, what matters? Things with wheels, lining things up, um, even the vacuum cleaner you notice is over in the corner, it made it into the line. So think about this one, what matters here? Order, comfort, soothing, coping. He loves to tidy up, his teacher reports. Her eyes do not meet mine. He really loves to tidy up. That's what he does. Other children play. Eric tidies up. When you are immersed in emotion, invested in something, you don't see it for what it is. The screen is grayed out for me. I do not see the picture clearly, and I do not connect the dots. If I could strip that emotion, make Eric not mine, perhaps I would be able to see a little boy cleaning up because creating order is comforting 
and comfort is soothing, and soothing is coping. At school, Eric is coping, just, but I don't see this. So my epiphany here was that, again, behavior is communication. There he is at school. He's not playing. He's not engaging with the other children. He's tidying up. He's cleaning up the classroom constantly. Once I understood that behavior is communication and how stressful it was for him to be at school, that he had autism, then everything made sense. Ah, sometimes actions become the words, his cleaning up when the words aren't possible. He couldn't tell anybody that he was so stressed. He didn't know why he was. And creating order, order is soothing. Eric tells me even now when he's outside sweeping or raking, oops, I'm trying to, there we go, or clipping or shoveling, anything like this is very grounding for him and it's repetitive action and it's creating order. So in this one, behavior, it matters. And really we can reframe and say poor behavior is good communication. We're always reacting to the environment. This is hard for me and this is what it's saying. Too many twos, too loud, too crowded, too noisy, too bright, too hot, too vague, too smelly, too long. What is this behavior saying? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Now, I just have to ask you for a moment. Do you see me? I seem to have lost myself. There I am. Okay, along this side. There we go. So here's an example of a video that we made about four or five years ago in Ottawa. And it was really intriguing for me. Um, my daughter helped me to make this and we called it stepping into the shoes of autism and just looking at behavior. It was based upon a case study in Ontario at the time of a young man in high school, I believe. And he pushed his school principal in the hallway. He was charged with assault. And, uh, but when um, people went in, autism advocates went in to piece it together, they realized what really had happened and it was nothing about assault. That day, his uh, educational assistant, the young man's EA, was absent. He had somebody new. There was a car alarm that went off and it wouldn't go off, it wouldn't stop in the parking lot. Also, the new EA took him into the hallways during a time that it was very crowded and he normally did not do that. So everything was different about this boy's day. And he was so stressed and the the hallway was crowded and he just had to get out of there so he pushed and he pushed and there was the principal and he pushed her as well so it was never a case of assault it was it was him trying to escape and just trying to to make a, a pathway to a calmer place for himself and we called it stepping into the shoes of autism and i have the shoe here because when we step into those shoes, everything is totally understandable. Now these shoes belonged to Eric when he was about 14. And as my daughter and I pointed out at the time, and you can see it in the picture, they're quadruple tied. And that tells us a lot about him, that he's very careful he, and um, he doesn't like surprises. So when you change shoes, you see things for what they really are. This one. Nice, happy one. What do you think? What matters here? We compile seven mini photo books of these what's not allowed signs, all before the age of digital photography. We are diligent and Eric is delighted. He is coping and we are obliging, doing our best to accommodate and understand his perspective. It seems like a small concession, the signs and the books, they make him happy. And a happy Eric is a happy family. I would later be told and quite agree, when one member of the family has autism, the whole family has autism. Eric has woken us up to rules and signs and symbols. Have I spent a lifetime looking but not seeing? My epiphany here, in order to connect with my son, I need to be still and notice what he notices. Celebrating a fascination brings us a lot closer together and helps me to understand him. 
So our first foray into Eric's world was through these what's not allowed. What matters here, fascinations, and you could call them special interests, whatever you wish, but that is a wonderful way to explore uh, the world with your child, what matters to them. So there were many fascinations and one of them was the what's not allowed. There was also Wales, and this is when we lived in Halifax, we're an armed forces family, so we moved across the country and uh, Eric loved everything to do with whales. So we went whale watching, read whale books, movies, puzzles, puppets, everything. Clouds, cloud formations, objects and their shadows. And this is when we moved back to this coast and it was in our backyard in, in Courtney. And Eric was noticing everything and the shadow that it created, which I thought was fascinating. And it's made me a better photographer because I started to notice these things as well. So we made him these little cards. We took all of these pictures and we made them matching sets of cards, which he loved and he carried those around in his hands. But I think the biggest fascination when he was about seven, eight, nine was space and everything to do with planets and outer space. So we bought this thing called, a, I think it says there, a home planetarium for his bedroom. And we blacked out his, his blackout blind and he could create you know, this whole planetarium on his ceiling of his, of his bedroom, which he loved. And he would do this when he came home from school because being at school was very stressful. And uh, so this was his way of coming down and, and escaping into a world that he could create. Um, there was something else called a 3D projector, which also projected ocean and, and space things on his ceiling that he particularly loved. So in terms of these fascinations, when you feel um, that your interests are being celebrated, you feel very good, of course. And these are ways to self-regulate. Like I said, he used to come home from school and and um, set up this planetarium in his bedroom or go through those what's not allowed books. And they, they help you to create order when things feel out of control. So they are a way to self-regulate. And maybe other kids are interested in whales or space or what's not allowed. And it's a way of connecting with other people. So absolutely, fascinations matter. This one. Here's his bedroom here in Comox back 10, 15 years ago. And what matters here? Maybe that mom likes to decorate, maybe stuffies, maybe jungle. Let's find out. Another bit of self-regulation is the emergence of Jungle Boy. I read that children with autism often attach to a character, real or fictitious, and become that persona. The theory is that it is easier to take on the traits and sound bites of a beloved book or movie hero than it is to make sense of who you are, especially if you are struggling each day to figure that out. So I have the hat here. Every day, Eric would come home from school. This was for a couple of years and on the weekends and change into this costume. And I found it fascinating that when he wore this costume, he felt a lot freer because social rules don't apply to people in costume. It's like going to a Halloween party, but kind of let loose. Well, he felt like that too. And he wasn't trying to understand, he didn't have to puzzle out the social world. He was Jungle Boy, he wasn't Eric. So this was a, a huge epiphany for me. I learned that environment calls the shots, unsupportive or supportive. Like in the pool, there were too many twos going on or wonderful supportive environments, completely, Eric, the, the best Eric comes out in those environments. So how well he does depends on where he is. And he is always reacting to his surroundings, always. We all are, but those with autism find it more difficult to, to self-regulate to their, their environment. So when we could, we try to create environments that support him and delight him like this jungle bedroom. But we can't always do that. At school, we can't do that. And out in public, we often can't do that. So when we could, we did. And when he was young, the, um, the jungle room was it for him. He loved going home to that. And you can see on the window, we had creatures, we had x-rays because he wanted to see what these creatures look like inside, jungle creatures, I think. 
And then he would change into this costume. So environment absolutely matters and it can be supportive or not. And then Eric will be his best Eric or not. And I wanted to point out that these epiphanies came throughout the journey and they also came, often came as sort of hard learning. And we went off track a lot. We got stuck a lot. And I refer to those as Grinch in the chimney moments. And these sticky moments come first. And then I imagine it like this. All of these challenges come up. Maybe things go off course at school or we need to investigate a new therapy because he's developed into the next stage or um, I don't know. There's always things that are written in his agenda and I'm dealing with many, many things. And as one mom mentioned to me, and I absolutely agree, and I found this as well, it was like a part-time or full-time job managing this autism world. So there are many challenges. And, but with each one of those challenges and each one of those sticky points, and when we felt like we went off track, really, that's when the learning take, took place. And there's that, that reframe again. The hard stuff can be very good. So that's when we had those Eurekas. And the journey for us, I like to say, is and it continues to be a trial and learning process. And not trial and error, because I think every error is really a learning point. And so like I, what I'm trying to say here, I suppose, is that it's not been a smooth journey. And it looks, in retrospect, like we figured it all out. But we didn't. We got stuck a lot and uh, move together with other parents and learn from a lot of people. So I'm going to switch things up a bit. And for the last half of the um, What Matters, the epiphanies, we'll do some quick word association. So let's take a look. For this one, this one is all about putting your mind into the mind of another and literally tuning in to someone. I hear my inner voice speak and what it says makes sense. To tap into Eric, immerse him in what he loves, water. Now this was kindergarten. He wasn't doing well all day school, kindergarten in Nova Scotia. So I thought, oh, do we leave him there all day? No. So twice a week I went and I got him and I brought him home. And uh, we lived, we backed onto a small lake at the time and we went out pedal boating. And he loved that. And he told me later, that's the only thing he remembers about kindergarten, those escapes. And uh, so my epiphany here is that attunement matters. Tuning in, and, and it's even, I, I think, more intense than stepping into someone's shoes. It's putting your mind into someone else's mind and trying to imagine exactly how they're feeling and what they're thinking. And if he could do something about that kindergarten, what would he do? And to me, I thought it's water and I have to tune in and, and do that for him. Here, when Eric was 17 and we were in Ottawa, he was asked to speak on Parliament Hill. And um, then he was given the choice of themes and what did he want to speak about? And this is an event that happens every year in the Hill called Autism on the Hill, somewhere around Autism Awareness Day. Well, he didn't have to think long. If you believe in me, I believe in me. If you think I can do it, then I think I can do it. He said he wanted to speak about belief because belief matters. And um, he was asked once um, on a panel if he could give advice to other parents, what would it be for them, the best thing they could give to their child? And he said belief. And, and this was a part of his speech it was much longer than that. And, and the words that I really liked were words that my father gave him when uh, Eric was first diagnosed. He said, my dad said to me, Eric will surprise you. And those were Eric, those were my dad's um, words of belief for Eric. And we've always fed those to Eric. And he says they make all the difference. But there's a bit of irony here. When I was first asked if Eric could speak on the hill, would he like to do that? I thought, no way. Absolutely not. He couldn't do that. Speak in front of hundreds of people and stand up there? No. And I have to tell you that I thought about this and I stepped into the shower and I call the shower my, my think tank. By the time I got out of the shower, I completely changed my mind. 
I thought, yes, he can do this. And that was my, okay, I got to give him some belief here, but I also have to help him do this. So it's not enough to say, I believe in you, but we have to enable and that matters as well. So what we did is we got a microphone, you can see it here, and it's from the We Rock Band. And we took it up to the hill, we wrote the speech together, took it up to the hill once or twice a week for an entire month. And we practiced and we stood and here he is standing with his back to center block looking out and there is um, West Block and uh, yeah, yeah, right, West Block, no East Block. Anyway, so he's looking out toward the flame down the bottom and he's practicing the speech holding up this fake microphone. And he's actually quite loving this and he would say to me, I think I'm drawing a minor audience <laughs> and people were going about their business. They really couldn't hear him because it was just a fake microphone. There was nothing going on. But the night before uh, the big day, there it is, and the resting speech, the night before he started his speech and I was listening to him. I was standing about where that man is down by the microphone. And all of a sudden three RCMP officers come rushing toward us and circle Eric and stop him. And they say, we have to ask what you're doing here. And they were a little, you know, abrupt. And uh, I said, we're practicing a speech. And Eric was, of course, you know, speechless. And uh, they said, but you can't do that. It's against the law to do that on, on the Hill, uh, to use a microphone without a permit. And they thought that he was um, a protester or something like that. And I said, oh, no, 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 you got it all wrong. They said, it's not a live microphone. I said, no, it's a toy. It's plugged into his pants, his pocket, into his shorts. And uh, then they understood and we took this lovely picture, which I would love to show you, but I, I don't have permission and they are the RCMP after all, so I better not put it on here, but it was a nice moment. And then after they dispersed, one of the police officers stood behind Eric with his you know, hands on his, on his hips in, in, in cock pose, and he listened as Eric practiced the speech one more time. And at the end, he came up to us and he said, I have a buddy with two kids with autism and it's a real hard, it's a rough go. It's a hard, hard you know, journey for them. So he says, keep up your good work. You're going to, you're going to change some minds out there. And Eric, just the belief from him, it just made him glow. So belief, does it matter? Oh, it absolutely does. Especially from us as parents. This one, here's a puppet. I've got one here actually to show you. And we have five of these wonderful Har Harbor Seal puppets that we bought when we were here in um, Comox and we were posted here probably 15 years ago. Puppets are unexpected points of entry into Eric. Wearing a Harbor, Harbor Seal on his arm, Eric's word output quadruples. So for me, this was fascinating to see that he wasn't talking about puppets, he was talking through the puppet. And like the costume, when he was wearing the puppet, he was much more expressive because he wasn't worried about the words he was choosing or whether they were socially appropriate or any rules because puppets are, are beyond that, they're immune to that. So I call these portals to potential and portals matter. There are ways in, ways to encourage the communication, whether it be um, verbal communication or it can be nonverbal as well, but they help to make connections. And uh, for us, they were the difference makers. This one, here's your, your hint here. This is a gem. Teresa, you'll be told again and again about everything that is wrong with Eric. Never forget about everything that is right with Eric. And my epiphany here, and these words were spoken to me by a speech language pathologist here in the Comox Valley shortly after Eric was diagnosed, and he could see how weighted down I was by, by the heaviness of the words. And mindset, I realized, matters. Where I set that dial, whether I have a growth mindset in terms of Eric, that he's um, able to grow and to always change, or whether I have a fixed mindset. That, and I, I believed that at first, that things were going to be stuck in the moment because that's what I was reading. And then I, the more I read, the more I realized, no, no, there's huge, huge potential for growth here. Words evaporate like they didn't even happen. Visuals adhere. My epiphany, and this relates to the eyes I showed you at the beginning, 
is that if people with autism think in pictures and are very visual, then we'd better use these visuals with them. So here is one that I really like over at the side here, and it's a chain. And it's something actually that my grade two teacher did with me way back long time ago in Nova Scotia. And in order to, to show us time and time passing and time remaining, she would make these paper chains. And so I began to do this with all of my kids. And I did this when we were going on a trip and we wanted to know how much time until the holiday began, or if it was something that we really didn't like, how much time do we have to endure this? And so if you have these paper chains, it's a visual of time which is an abstract concept, of course, but you're giving them a concrete version of this and uh, something that can be understood. So every day, for example, this was how many days until the end of grade eight? Grade eight was not a good school year, so we were counting down and we would rip off a link every day on this chain and Eric could see time, time passing and how much time remained. So whenever I can, I use visuals, they matter. And this is the last one, I believe. And uh, in a rainbow at home, in a rainbow row of plastic baskets in Eric's bedroom, rest widgets and trinkets called fidget toys. We learn that busy hands calm and focus the mind. So I've got one here. You know, you've seen these squishy toys. Well, these worked wonders with Eric. And um, when he had these in his hands, he was a lot more focused, a lot more calm. And we all use these things, you know, you, the sports, you can get them as sports, um, squishy um, objects and things like that with different grip strengths. But self-regulation hugely matters because it's the way that we cope with our environment and the way that we bring our energy up or down or, or adjust to what needs to be, what we need to be doing. So here are some of the squishy toys. This was a, um, a weighted cushion and that's what I was telling you a lap cushion and we had it in the van and I made them for all three of our, our kids because they like those and it just made them feel grounded. Um, that's what Eric would put on his head and he would I would find him a lot with that on his head so he could seek get the deep pressure input. So I was told early on to understand how emotion and how the environment and everything feels for an a child with diverse needs to multiply by 10. So I'm thinking about us now in this pandemic and how we've all felt sort of frustrated has gone on for a long time and uncertain and, and all of those things Well, multiply that by 10 and then you understand the experience for someone with autism. It's quite profound and I do this a lot. I multiply a lot to try to imagine what it feels like. So Self-regulation matters because it helps us to adjust to an environment that has too many twos, might be too loud too, too, or too quiet or something going on too long or too bright or too stuffy or too vague, the expectations at school. Something isn't right. So you can't always change the environment if it has too many twos, but you can change your behavior. You can advocate for things that you need and you can use um, self-regulation. Last year, Eric and I participated in a webinar um, out of Toronto uh, about um, those with autism and how they could adapt and cope with the pandemic. And he called it, what do I need to succeed? And there's Eric. And he talked about using a weighted blanket and about how music helps him to regulate. And he talked about his man cave, which is a um, his closet, his walk-in closet, with, with which has lots of pictures and memories from his life. So it gives him a, a context and, and 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 a past and a present. And this is who I am. And there's music in there, and there are movies in there, and some food. And so it's a nice place for him to go. And he also talked about using an exercise ball chair while he's on the computer. And he talked about there he is when he was younger, things that were important to him to help calm him at that time and regulate to his environment. The fidget toys, the weighted lap cushion, the weighted blanket, a duvet wrap, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. Um, this body sock, which helped him to know where his body was in space. And uh, tents, small spaces. Um, we, I think in Halifax in our house there, we 
took each of their closets and we made them into decorated little clubhouses and they would um, invite each other into their clubhouses and kitchen cupboard with a mirror and when he was really little we nailed a mirror and he would go in there and talk to the other Eric uh, and here's some more examples so there he is with the weighted blanket and it feels like when you go to the dentist and they put the the weighted um, x-ray lead um, blanket on you and how, how grounding that feels this is a snug vest which was developed in Vancouver and you can actually pump in air and it, and it puts pressure on your back, which um, is very calming. And this duvet wrap is really easy to do and it feels really good. You might wanna try it. You, know, you have someone wrap you up quite tightly in a duvet because it's got some weight and calm, turn down the lights and put some nice music on. And uh, it's very, it brings you down. It, it lowers your anxiety. And as Kim says, when in doubt, seek deep pressure because it will always work to calm you. But I think for me on this autism journey, I think the biggest eureka of all has been in kind of in something that I didn't expect, in a twist that I hadn't expected, Eric and others with autism and living with autism have opened my eyes, and there's those eyes again, to really what matters in life. Humility, mindfulness, altruism and I'm thinking about things that Eric does around the house he'll fold laundry and he'll sweep and he'll clean and he'll water and he'll do all these little things without being asked and he, without any expectation of being thanked or acknowledged he does it just for the sake of doing it and he'll do good acts for people without any expectation at all and he lives without ego he cheers for everyone and he's pleased when people do well. And I don't know many people like that. And he lives without any agenda or jealousy or judgment. And he's quite pure. And uh, so I feel quite fortunate to experience this firsthand and uh, what this feels like and to discover my epiphany that autism matters and diversity matters and neurodiversity matters. We need all types. He is like us and not. In many ways, he is better than we are. He shows no pride, no jealousy, no competition, no prejudice, no judgment, no boastfulness, no ego. Eric just is. The awe invites me to sit taller, to see the big picture and to understand what counts. Eric and other Eric's do that. They feed us perspective because they flip convention. They slow us down and offer mindfulness straight from the source. In the words of the Honorable Mike Lake, we just need to take time to notice. Now, Mike Lake is a member of parliament, a federal mem member of parliament who has a son with autism around Eric's age. And uh, he advocates right to the um, UN level. And every uh, Autism Awareness Day, he makes this wonderful one minute speech in the House of Commons. And he's looking up into the gallery into he connects with his son and it's a lovely moment. He's doing them now virtually from his, his um, home in Edmonton, but he's done a lot of great work for autism. So I'm um, quite pleased to, to finish up with his quotation there. So your child, and in <laughs> the old Ontario license plate, your child is yours to discover, especially if you take the time to stand in their shoes, you'll discover more and more about them. And I invite you to do that and to enjoy the journey. So I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open to talking about things and, and, and your questions. I will just stop my screen share here. There we are. Thank you so much, Teresa. That was really amazing. Thank you. I just wanna say before we jump into questions um, that Teresa's book is available for sale locally at the Laughing Oyster. Blue Heron Books and Cole's Bookstore at the Driftwood Mall. And if you're not local, then you can buy your book on Amazon or Chapters Indigo. Are there any, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Teresa, it, yes. it's, it's Richard. Um, the, this obviously, uh, your journey with Eric is taking a lot of time 
uh, energy love. Um, but you had other children, and I'm wondering how you did the balance. Um, you know, often a child with I'll use the phrase special needs, but uh, does take all that it does take a lot of time and effort, and other children can get felt left behind or left out or. Oh, that, that's a great question. And I, I was aware of that all the time. And not to mention a husband, you know, <laughs> there's him too. You know? and, and there's only so much time in a day and only so much energy. And how do you how do you cut that pie? And that was always, always my um, dilemma. And, and I, I thought about it a lot. So I, I thank you for asking that. I think what I tried to do is make it fun. You can tell, I mean, I love, fun stuff like puppets and costumes and everything and try to include all of them in everything that I did with Eric. So when I, I would set up, for example, um, we had this whole wall of, of choices of things to do, photographs of things that Eric could do because he had a hard time figuring out how to, how to use his time. So I did it for all of them. If I did a timeline for him, I would do it for all of them. If we had costumes and puppets for him, it was it was sort of all of us together. And I think it helped that we're, because we're an armed forces family, we're kind of like this little unit within, you know, because we move and, and so we depend on one another and we become very close because we have to, we're all we have when we pull up roots and move. So I, I tried, I always tried to do stuff that would include all of them and make Eric's therapy not even seem like therapy. So when we had equipment in the basement, these swings and Lycra things, they all used it. So I tried to disguise it, I guess that's probably my best answer, but it was really hard. And then there were always pulls and that's why it truly is like a full-time job. I'll bet, thank you. Any other questions? Teresa, you talked a lot about um, kind of calming and um, mm -hmm. techniques uh, to kind of bring Eric down is is that kind of the most important um, technique that you can think of to use with a child of well, autism, or were there any other things that that are really helpful? That's a good question. And interestingly, for Eric, um, we had to quite now it's bringing him down. I think calming him but when he was young he was sort of very floppy his posture and everything and we were bringing him up more than bringing him down he was kind of lethargic and uh, so our what we had were these swings in the basement that rotational swings to to bring up his energy before homework bouncing on the trampoline all of those things so we when he was younger it was all about bringing him up um, and then I think as he got older, we were kind of always regulating and maybe bringing him down a little bit with the, these more weighted products that he talked about. And, uh, but I, I think if I had to say about all of the things that matter, if I had to sort of rank order them, I would say what you're, you're talking about that self-regulation, regulating to the environment was probably the number one thing that we had to teach him. Because if you can't, if you're feeling really sensory overload and unbalanced you can't focus on anything else you can't focus on friendships you can't focus on your family on relationships on academics or anything so we really had to get him either bring up his energy or bring it down we had to regulate him to the environment first and teach him how to do that so it was it was an ongoing mm -hmm. any other I think I've, I've been asked, I'll just jump in many times. And um, if I could give advice to parents, what would it be? Especially parents starting out on their autism journey. And for me, I think I believed when Eric was first diagnosed that where he was, what, he, he was sort of fixed at that point. But I learned quite quickly from reading and from observing him that no, huge, there's a huge potential for growth. And it's, it's ongoing, he's always changing. And um, so I want parents to know that, yes, it's, it's a dynamic journey. And the, I think what I really tried to do is through those interests, through 
the what's not allowed through um, clouds, through um, space, through all of those things, was to always celebrate him and keep him talking and keep him in our world through his interests. So I think that's another thing I would recommend to parents. Keep, stay connected, stay connected as much as you can by noticing what they love and then go for those things and, and do it in as many creative ways as you can. And they're celebrations. So that would be another thing that I would, I would say. It, it's an, it's a, a journey that's got tons of growth and you can capitalize on that by looking at what they love and, and celebrating that. Any others? I know sometimes it's hard to think of questions and you'll think of them after for sure. Was there anything that surprised you about the autism journey? Yeah, I think that the environment was such a big thing. I remember, you know, and at home, because we had it so tailored to Eric and he was so comfortable there, he was like a different person. And when I would go into school and observe him there, it wasn't the same at all. I remember in one classroom, he was off to the side picking at his running shoe and, and shouting and he wasn't, he wasn't with the other kids at all physically or, or mentally. He was off on his own and, and yelping and shouting and, and I had never seen him like that. And so I realized how much environment um, plays a huge part. And that we always have to be trying to tweak that environment and making it make it uh, work for him. So that that was a big that was a big um, surprise for me. How much environment changes him, and that is difficult for him to to uh, to relate to the environment. Did I just see something in chat from from Noor? There was a question. Yeah, there's a question. Um, do you think genetic testing is is um, an important part of understanding your child on the spectrum? Mm. Genetic testing to understand, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, Noor, do you mean once your child is diagnosed? Yes. So, uh, well, yeah, do you think getting a genetic test is important for because you can understand other children that maybe have this, if it's a genetic or if it's a mutation and just things to expect along the journey or mm. where kids are that maybe have the same, if you share the same genetic um, or mutations as other kids, is there any knowledge in getting a genetic test? You know, I've never considered that. I just you know, there were so many behavioral things that pointed to autism and, 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 and all the markers fit. So I just, I, I never considered that. I don't know. And I think that would be something that to bring up with a, um, a psychologist. Uh, I don't know enough about that to answer that in a way that probably would be helpful for you. But um, I guess in terms of knowing what to anticipate, um, and you know, and you know that when you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. So we can't, we can never generalize, but I think it's always kind of nice to know what you can, what you can expect. But there's a lot of reading you can do about that without, without the genetic test. But like I said, I think I would, I would refer to a psychologist or someone who could give you professional advice about that. Okay, thanks. Yes. Anything else? I think what maybe strikes you when you hear these things that matter, they matter for all of us, don't they? This is not just about autism. It's about what's important for all of us. We all need believers and we all need the environment to be working for us. And uh, we all need these things. And so this is what's been striking for me and, and a surprising thing for me throughout this journey as well is that Eric is absolutely a version of all of us. And I think of it as the, the stereo sliders, you know, and we're all on the spectrum somewhere. And, uh, but someone with a diagnosis just has more of the sliders moved up to the higher position. So for the him, these things that matter absolutely matter and they're critical and they really make a difference. For the rest of us, they're nice to have. But but they're good. I mean, I, I, I need believers. I need people in my corner and I need people enabling me and I need people giving me feedback. We all need these things. 
But I think with our children with autism, multiply by 10, they need them, they really need them. So that's been a, a, a learning thing for me. I just have one more question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Fire away. The, the, the um, slides you showed of Eric playing with the puppet really intrigued me. And I was just wondering, did he mostly engage with the puppet when other children or somebody else was um, playing with it? Or did he just like to put on his own hand and talk to it? himself well we like i said we have five of those it was a, a family of of, sea, <laughs> of these um harbor seals and we would take them on vacation with us they're always in the van and we would take them everywhere and all three of them would have them on and i remember this picture of them as we drove across canada on one of our postings and they would be all looking out the window talking through these these harbor seal puppets and carrying on this conversation so i mean i i love puppets and and my kids know that so Quite, or sometimes I would talk to him with the puppet because I knew that that would be a way that he would would reply. So we use these in fun. Um, usually it was with with the other two as well, with Scott and with Heather that he would do this. Yeah, but it sure made a difference. It was absolutely and same with that costume. Just freed him up, and he just became something that that had no constraints and no judgment and nothing. And it was just, just a different child and with the puppet as well. So that's why I call those the portals to potential because I saw, I saw a, a, different, a different version of Eric. Janine, did you have a comment or? No, I've just enjoyed this so much. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I remember that bedroom. Oh, yes. G that Janine. Jungle. Yeah. <laughs> Janine was a huge part of our early autism journey here in Comox. After Eric was diagnosed, Eric would, um, you were his EA for a while at school, but also Eric um, had um, worked with you one-on-one -on -one, or you worked with him as a, a respite worker. You, you, you were a lifesaver to me. You took him away, you did all sorts of neat things with him. And you taught me and Eric a lot about the self-regulation, the fidget toys, and how how does your motor run, and how you know whether you need how to regulate to the environment. Um, so you were a huge part of our early learning, and I thank you for that. And that's wow. why when Eric saw you in a video a year or two ago, he just totally lit up. He said, "That's Mrs. Calder." So you know you made a difference, and you were part of this the wisdom that is in the book. The wisdom is not my wisdom it's the wisdom a collective wisdom of all these people that we've met on this journey and i just say i was wise enough to collect it but it's mostly not my own and uh, so you were one of them and i thank you for that you're very welcome and i see oh i see a little thing in the chat oh yes bonnie um oh thank you bonnie and bonnie was someone that i met in ottawa so it's nice to see her here it's neat yeah any others or are we? Thank you very much for coming this evening, Teresa. And yeah, as I said at the beginning, we'll post this presentation on our on the library website and hopefully it will be a valuable resource for all of our customers. Well, thank you very thank you very much for organizing this, Natalie. You are wonderful with your posters and, and, and promoting and and, and just understanding how important it is um, that we all know more about autism and whether we have someone in our family with autism or not. I think it's just, for me, it's, it's a journey of, of understanding and it's, it's normalizing um, diversity. And the more we know, the more it's, it's, we take the mystery out of it and it becomes an everyday thing. And that's what we want. We want to include everyone and make diversity a, a, an everyday word that um, mm -hmm. is understandable to everyone and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank so, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.